It's not so much about you must be right or you must be wrong, it's about how do we become right and wrong. The purpose of an instructor is to guide, to motivate, inspire the students so that they can master themselves, their character, and ultimately their lives. We're not practicing the eye to kill opponents, we're practicing the eye to face ourselves. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Tokushikai Inside Look podcast. Today we're speaking with Grandmaster Tim Wakefield of the Shaolin Martial Arts Center in Aurora, Canada. Tim Sensei has been training for over 37 years, during which time he has traveled the globe to expand his knowledge of the martial arts and has achieved senior certifications in several unique disciplines, including 9th Dan Shaolin Kenpo Kung Fu, 5th Dan in Kendo Federation Iaido, and 4th Dan in Kendo Federation Jodo. Please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation where Tim Sensei shares his motivations for starting martial arts, the responsibilities of teachers versus coaches versus instructors, and the difference in methods for adults and kids. So without further ado, here's Grandmaster Tim Wakefield. I joined the martial arts because I was getting bullied by students, teachers, just about everybody around me. Apparently, they didn't like hippie artist kids. They kind of pinned a target on my back, and I ended up getting beat up a lot. So, in 1983, I tricked my parents into getting me into my first school, which was the Valari Studio of Self-Defense, teaching the discipline of Shaolin Kempo Karate. Uh, now, like most people at that time who start martial arts, I uh, didn't really know much about it at all. In fact, I probably knew less than anybody about the martial arts because uh, I, my world had been basically Garfield, Heathcliff, Marmaduke, you know, cartoon characters. My dad was a cartoonist, so that was my world was cartoons. And I'd only heard the name Bruce Lee in passing in the schoolyard and had no idea what it meant. And I see these guys going, wah, 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 around right the schoolyard. And I go, like, I don't get it. So I just ignored them. But I go into the, the Shaolin. And uh, they start talking about Shaolin and Shaolin temples and monks. And they start talking about all these Asian cultural things. And I, I didn't really know what to make of that either. But what I did notice was when I joined, they didn't really give you a lot of ways of introduction. It was basically, here's your uniform, get on the floor, now follow us. So I'm staying in the middle of these, you know, you know like 20 kids. And I look around, and all of them got black uniforms and colored belts. And I'm like the one guy wearing a white outfit with a white belt. And they're all going, hoo, hoo, hoo. I'm like, What's this who stuff? Am I, did I just walk into a class of owls? So, you know, eventually I caught on that this was a shout and that it was meant to be used with the punches and there was no explanation. You just did. Teacher said you do no questions. And there was not a lot of kids at the time because we're talking 1983. So the kids programs were not that big. Martial arts at the time was populated mostly by teenagers and adults, people who you know, wanted to learn how to fight people who wanted to learn practical defense for the street, because that was the emphasis of martial arts at that time. There wasn't a lot of this, what works in the ring bullshit. It was basically what worked. So the training was naturally tough. There was not a lot of the, let's pat the kid on the back, give him a high five and make him happy. It was like, you do the training and if you get hurt, that's okay. You brush off, work through it, come back when you're healed, that kind of thing. An example of a lesson, like in Kempo, they are the, one of the, you know, the key mantras of Kempo was, training doesn't stop until blood hits the floor. <laughs> so, okay, time to wash off the floor, class ends. But that common instruction is that hurt in sparring. They would say, well, don't block with your face. Move, get out of the way, do something. But I was a man on a mission because I really wanted to understand how to protect myself. I had no natural instinct for this, being a cartoonist and all. When did the bullying stop? Bullying stopped. I mean, it never really stopped, but I'll tell you that the guy that got me into it, he's actually now a police officer, go figure, but he punched the living crap out of me in grade seven to the point where it took four teachers to pull him off of me. It was that bad, all because I got a better mark than him in class, and that's what got me in. A year later, the school was offering this sort of uh, elective program where every Friday for the afternoon, the students got to sign on for these various off-site activities. And one of them would have to be offered by the martial arts school I was attending, Fred Valaris. I thought, great, I'm going to sign on to this because, hey, I can get out of school for an afternoon and do extra practice. 
And this kid, he saw me do this and he didn't know I was training at the time. He said, oh, I'm going to join this too so that I can beat you. So we ended up going to the school and I had my backpack and he had his backpack. We get in the change room and he put on his bright red Coca-Cola track suit. And I reached my bag and pulled out the black karate uniform with the crane patches on the back and the school crest in the front. And he just kind of looks at me and says, you go here? I said, yep. <laughs> and he goes, oh, okay, well, I'm still going to kick your ass. So we get on the floor, and of course, my teacher paired me off with him specifically for the partner training. And we have these a series of self-defense sets called combinations. They're uh, fighting situational scripted techniques, kind of like touch Uchi for Kempo. But the idea is it's hard and fast. So he would task us with this one called combination number three. So I just punches in. I tried to do it. It didn't work. Right? Slams me to the floor. I get up. I go to Master Chang. Here you are. And go... It's not working. So Master Chong puts his hand on my shoulder and says, Tim, are you doing combination number three? And I went, well, I just did this. And this and says, no, no, no. Look me in the eye. I didn't ask if you practiced in combination three. Are you doing combination number three? And I kind of clicked on me for a moment. I was like, am I getting permission to do something here? Yeah, I'm getting permission. So then I went back and he threw in his punch. I dodged hit his gut, push his arm down, smack him in the head, flip him on the floor, pound him in the chest, and it worked. I'm going like, oh my God, it worked. Right? Then he get, the kid gets angry, he gets up, and he starts chasing me around the room. I, I'm blocking out, I'm kicking him, blocking him, chopping him, throwing him on the floor and back up again, and all this stuff is just coming forward. So like after a year of training, I just went, holy crap, there's something here. So a kid whose self-esteem level was below floor level suddenly shot like up into the ceiling and it woke me up. It, it, it turned on some lights and I thought to myself, besides the fighting ability here, there is something here that can teach me how to gain this much confidence and gain this much ability. Then what else is there I can learn? What more is there to this pile? And that's where the obsession with martial arts really began. Eventually, as uh, time passed, I became curious enough to investigate other systems. And this was about three or four years in. All we did was train in Bujinkan, do our work at the security companies. All our times off, we would spend at training in the park, practicing for among ourselves, or we'd visit every dojo in town. There was a point in time where I pretty much knew every master instructor in town. I trained everyone from Master Huang, even Kamehameha, they popped in on it a few times. Some places we stayed at for a long time, some places we stayed at for a short time. When we ran into fakes, we ran into real stuff, because we had the same idea. Let's find out what makes everyone think they're so good what makes a style from this style, so on. We ran into the guys who were teaching out of books under their desk, and we ran into the guys who were the genuine article. <laughs> so I ended up learning a lot of fringe styles and fringe things that are not part of the mainstream of martial arts. So I went out and basically learned everything I could. <laughs> that is a great lead into my second question, which was sure. you finally realized that this stuff was real and you could actually apply it. Uh, when yes. you started looking at all these other people and you said some were legit, some were not so how quickly did you figure out who was legit and not, and how did you realize what was right? Well, some I, you know, are, were blatantly obvious. Uh, you could see it right away when you're sitting in a dojo interviewing with the master or the teacher, and uh, he's looking under his desk occasionally and then looking over his class, looks under his desk, says, hold on a second, walks away and starts teaching something. And you lean over his desk and you see there's a book on karate underneath the, at the top there. And it's like, okay, he's teaching out of a book. So that was pretty obvious. There were some guys who were blatant fakes and liars. But a lot of great guys like Omi Sensei, Kameda Sensei, these were good uh, you know, characters I, I met. Um, you know, you know, people from the ninja, ninja community who were actually normal. They were pretty cool. I met a lot of great guys who were solid martial artists, you know, true to the roots. Uh, Yuan Zheng, my Shaolin master now. Some really good quality people in the martial arts. They exist. There's a yin and yang to everything. For every good person there is, there's about 10 weirdos out there that we're trying to track. You have Shaolin masters who are great at Qigong, but aren't fighters. You have guys who are fighters, but they're not technicians. You have technicians, but they're not performers. You have performers, but they're not medical experts, and so on. We're all part of the same discipline. We all have the same root and the same connection, right? So martial arts is the same. Any martial arts uh, you know, system should be able to do this. So you'll have guys who are in Yai, for example, who like anime. 
and want to try and appeal to that sense. You'll have people come into a guy because they're academics and they love to analyze stuff to the umpteenth degree. They really get jazzed by the idea that they can nitpick things and be very particular. And so what, yeah, oh, that's you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, right, and then you get those who are into the spiritual content of it. And then you get those who are into the applied content of it. So they're more tactile and sensory kind of thing. So we have to realize that most people join martial arts for their own reasons. And sometimes they may not always realize uh, what those reasons are. They'll start with one and then they'll come to the realization of another and then they'll hone in on that. It's kind of like when people go to university in their first year, they have an idea what they want, but they don't know what they want. And in the second year, they switch their majors because they found what they want. How do you help a student figure out what are they looking for in the martial art? And then how do you adapt the martial art to them? Adults can do a lot of research. They might have a more clear picture, but they might not. Kids have no idea what they want. So okay. this process of helping them discover what is it that, what is their goal? And then how do well, you? Well, so I would, for the idol crowd, I would draw back to the Guelph Seminar and say, Chris Mansfield brought up some very interesting points along that idea. In that when you have a student, instead of trying to force the person to fit the mold that you uh, that your martial art is trying to do. There is a certain amount of that because you do have to have that shoe element where you are following and then the high element where you're imitating and then your re element where you're mastering. So, and that goes with only since it's shoe how read the discussion. So um, that does play a part in it where when you have a student on the floor, you have to observe what they're doing. Not just teach the technical points, not just run to the grain points. Yes, we need those. So you have to have that uh, to build the foundations to get to the point that we're talking about. But ultimately, as a student develops, you have to observe them and see where their character is taking them, where, they're, uh, where their path is taking them, and make the adjustments according to this. So now when it comes to how people join a school, adults can get information. Sometimes you can get too much information or the wrong kind of information. And so it is our job as instructors to educate. When I do my instructor training programs, I ask my students, what does the instructor do? And of course, the very first thing that everybody says, whether they're a kid or adult, they say, well, they teach martial arts. And I say, no, that is not what instructors do. Okay, that's what an instructor gets to do. That's our privilege. We get to teach the martial arts. What does instructor really do? We promote and educate what martial arts are about. So our job, as soon as they walk in the door, is to educate that person to what we are and then see if we can find a common ground that matches what they're looking for. Because we need to, might not be what they're looking for. If a guy comes to me and says, I, listen, I want to get in the ring and knock heads, I just, I don't care about forms and techniques. So I just want to get in there and box people. And I said, well, guess what? Here's a number of my friend down the street. He teaches just the thing you're looking for now because yeah, this is what we do. And that's what he does. Did I help you? Yes. Very good. Go find your path. And not after the money. If you got a guy who wants to make money, he'll say, yes, I can teach everything you know. I'm trying to teach something else. So that's right. When it comes to kids, well, it's not the kids who are signing up. The kids aren't deciding. They just say, mom, I want to try karate. So mom says, right. She goes online, searches things up, finds a place that looks wholesome and kind of friendly and welcoming to kids. And then she goes in and makes a phone call, sets an appointment. And uh, they may have next to no knowledge of martial arts, which is most times the case. And it comes down to being able to outline to the mom what the benefits are to the kid. Kids are blank slates. So there's a difference between teaching kids and adults. They come in with nothing. They you know, Literally, they got nothing. They don't have any previous habits. They don't have any preconceptions. They just have what they, maybe what they've seen on TV and cartoons and stuff. So in one hand, <clears throat> that makes them easy because we can start from scratch. We can build those habits. What makes it hard is that they don't have the communication to understand the references that you're giving them. So you have to try and simplify your language, talk at a level that they understand, and reference techniques from what they understand. They're purely physical at this point. There's no sense in getting into internal concept with them. You just have to you know, teach them this is what it is, and this is how you do it. And then as their understanding builds and they get older and their maturity kicks in, now you can start adding in all that nice internal stuff that makes martial arts work. With adults, they're easy to teach because they have comprehension. And you can explain to them in terms that are equal to your own in some ways. You can use all the terms you want and they'll, and they'll grasp it and get it, right? 
but they're harder to teach because they come in with at least 15 to 20 or 30 years worth of habits, good and bad, that they've picked up along the way, injuries and mindsets, preconceived notions, ideas, sensitivities, politics, all kinds of stuff you have to kind of chisel and whittle away at before you can get them to the point of essentially uh, no mind, if you will, to that point where they, they're actually moldable and directionable. So again, the yin and yang exists when it comes to the methods of teaching kids and adults and how you would guide each one with kids they're impressionable and they, and they can be led easily and then as they grow you can direct their growth with adults you got to break them down before you can do that <laughs> could you give one example of someone that came in and you're like okay i'm not sure if they really fit this but let's see where they go and then it end up totally fitting and then on a counter example where a kid comes in and you're like oh, i don't think this person's going to make it and then surprising you by continuing on for a long time yeah, I, I, I usually pride myself on being able to identify who my black belt's going to be within the first month of training. <laughs> so, but sometimes I've been pleasantly surprised. I have one good kid like that. This is a kid who might as well have been just a walking noodle. His bones were there, but they had absolutely no control in them whatsoever. So he, he could barely hold himself up. I thought to myself, oh my gosh, this guy's, what, what have they done with this kid? You know, no, no activities, nothing before he got here. Like nothing that just strengthened the muscles and bones, no running, no sports. Oh my gosh. And it, it really was sketchy for a long time, but he stuck with it. He was determined. And today he's uh, 12 years old. He's a black belt. And he has his moments where something kind of goes a little wonky, but I think that's mostly where he's at in his growth development physically, you know, the, you know as, a, as a person and uh, as a physical being. And uh, he's done really well for himself. Like he, he knows his stuff and he can do his stuff and he's not jangly anywhere. He has power. So, you know, which is good. So how do I measure a black belt in this case? A black belt isn't just someone who's learned the curriculum and mastered to some degree. I, mean, I hear all these guys out there say, oh, you can't be a black belt till you're 16 because you don't have life, life experience or you can't fight anyone because you're too small. It's like, give me a break. If you've got a kid who's lasted seven years of martial arts training, learned the entire crown, can perform that curriculum and is able to use it effectively against people at least a year or two older than him, which is who our natural enemy is going to be anyway, he's a black belt. All right. Some of these kids have better disposition than the adult black belts. Life experience? Tell me what 16-year-old has life experience. So those are two of the excuses that a lot of martial arts pedal out there to try and say why a kid can't be a black belt. I say black belt's a state of mind, not a universal standard. There's no such thing as a universal standard in anything. We're people. The second kid, I've, I've had lots of kids, from autism kids uh, and to uh, Asperger's kids. One of my more recently successful ones, I thought this one was going to drop out because she came to me with, she was born with a, um, a tumor on her brain. And at the age of two, they had to go into her head, separate the brain, get the tumor. And to this day, she's still, the brain's still healing. So she has like partial vision, one eye, full vision, another eye, but it kind of points this way. Her spatial senses were all over the place. Balance on her right side of the body was completely gone. And I told the parents, well, you know what? Physically, she's going to struggle a lot here. But I see that there's a desire in her and that there's a passion in her that you know says that she wants something. She wants to overcome this. So I think if she's willing to put in the work and put in the time, uh, then I think she will make a dent in it. I would never expect her to be a perfect martial artist or to be even a great martial artist. But I do expect that she will you know, learn to become, to become comfortable with herself and have pride in herself and know that she can do things and conquer things that you know, were otherwise unconquerable. And so here she is today. She's 14 years old. She has, uh, you know, her brain is still mending. It's getting better. But now she has balance, forms, memory. She doesn't lose control of her technique. She has some visual acuity, better than before. She still has problems with some distancing, but now she's beginning to sense distance rather than look at distance or feel distance. She can use her awareness now, which is you know, developing. And the parents are uh, beyond themselves with pride you know, and relief because they thought that they were going to be struggling for the rest of her life with this one. They would find nothing that would fit this child. And she really uh, came through. Actually, my favorite student for this was a guy that I had that was born with club feet. Right? When he was about two or three years old, parents uh, had a uh, tongue to dodge. They broke his ankles and his foot set in the right direction. But they were kind of offset. 
So soccer teams were telling him, you can't play soccer because you can't run. All the sports were saying, you can't do our sport because that's hockey. You can't do it because your feet can't fit into skates. You can't hold your balance. You can't do this. Brought him to me, and I looked at him, and I went, okay, well, let's try. So we put him on the floor. And it was, and so his feet were off. I said, all right, so you just got to learn where your, knee, where your feet are. But you've got a different balance position than other people. Let's find it. <laughs> you know? And I was like 20 two twenty three at the time and I, I looked at this kid and said, I think you can do martial arts. I don't see why you can't do this. We just adapt it to him. Sometimes you have to find a lot of people get stuck in this mindset that martial arts that you have to fit the martial art. No, the martial art has to fit you. The martial arts to adapt to what you're doing. It's merely the tool and the direction. It's not the result. It's not the carrier. You're the carrier of the martial arts. So if you have a limitation, then that martial art has to work with you. It's not the other way around. Yes, we do have to follow the rules of, uh, of the techniques and say, well, okay, cut goes like this and goes like this. But how we manipulate our body to make that happen is up to us. It's not up to the art. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, I love those three examples because yeah. it's, it's a, one of those scenarios where everyone struggles to a bit, like not to that extreme, but there are going to be people that are not at the top of their game that go to a dojo and look around and it's like, I'm not performing even close to these other students. So how did you keep them motivated? How did you get, get them to feel confident that they could stay in there and succeed? Because people tend to get hung up on what is right or what is wrong. Big X, big circle, right, wrong, ton, ton. Everyone tries to put martial arts into these very arbitrary terms. It's not just the eye. You know, Yado tends to put that negative reinforcement aspect in, you know, almost on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. It's saying something like a staple of the art. Most martial arts will do the same thing. No, this is wrong. You can't do this. You must do it this way. And they get that very stern tone. But the thing is, is it about right or wrong? Or is it about appropriate and inappropriate? Is this appropriate for the way this person is moving or, or, or inappropriate for the way this person is moving? And what is that person's limitation? What are they fighting against? Do they have fibromyalgia? Do they have brain injuries? I've got two students with me right now. they got brain injuries. I've got a lot of this kind of stuff. You have to be flexible when you're looking at these guys and say, okay, is it so terribly important that we hug the rules as tightly as possible? Or is it more important that we get the person to experience a, uh, a success in the move? And in my experience in teaching, it is, and even as a student learning, it is the success that drives us or the striving for that success. It's not so much about the achievement. It's about the fact that we worked hard to get there and we got it. And then, we have, and then we're ready to move to the next degree of that success. And so what we try and do is we build upon that success. One of the masters I worked with years back, uh, Master John Fritz, he you know, was a big Tai Chi and also a student of Fred Valari. And he said to people, martial arts are not about fighting. Martial arts are success systems. Because these systems wouldn't exist if they weren't successful in the first place. <laughs> We're teaching people how to find success within themselves through their actions, mindfulness of what we do and what, and what we're engaged in. If we constantly beat people down by saying, no, this is wrong. No, everything you learned is wrong. No, you're practicing wrong. This is bad. Everything is bad. And you must be like me or be like this or follow this. And all that does is uh, in the long term frustrates people and gets them to feel like they're not good at what they're doing. Or they're never going to really get this and uh, they will drop. No one likes to see their students quit. I certainly don't, but I don't look at it and say we're filtering out the weak and the strong. I say that we failed at being able to reach that person and hold to their path, or that person realized a path that was more suitable to them than us. So we have to be willing to accept both of those points. We're not always going to be what they're looking for, and in the end, it may take them a while to realize that when they do, we have to be willing to let go. We should not be attached. But in that detachment, we shouldn't be trying to find scapegoats or justifications that put it into the negative frame, the saying that they weren't good enough to be with us. That's wrong. I want them to be able to do good kids. I want them to be able to do, do good Nuki skin. So how do I motivate a person to do this? How do I reach that person, make them understand how his body and why his body needs to move this way to make that happen? Let's turn on a few light switches in their mind. Let's not shut the door in their face. And just because someone reaches a level of you know, black belt, third dan, four dan, five dan, these degrees do not denote whether or not somebody has the ability to teach correctly. Being a master of the technical doesn't necessarily mean you understand how to teach people. 
technical. You can show the technical, you can instruct the technical, but you cannot teach people. Which brings to the idea of what is the difference between a teacher and an instructor? And I, this is not my own knowledge, by the way. This is stuff I've learned from other martial arts instructors, from martial arts industry officials, organizations uh, like Maya, the Martial Arts Industry Association, the Mata Martial Arts Teaching Association, even going so far as uh, ATA, Master Bill Clark's American Taekwondo Association. They, all these guys have come up with formulas and methods for teaching. Uh, Stephen Oliver, Mile High Karate, has entire systems based on how to teach people how to teach. Uh, Mike Massey, another guy. And he's actually the best of them all, I think. So <clears throat> when we're making a, a comparison uh, between the act of teaching in schools and uh, martial arts, we have to know the difference between what a teacher, what a coach is, and what an instructor slash mentor is. Now, teaching, my guys, what is an instructor? Not don't want to know what does an instructor do, that we covered that before, but what is an instructor? And most guys will say, well, he's a guy who knows stuff, who teaches you things. Here's a view I present to them. A teacher, uh, and you can put this in educational context as well, a teacher will present students with a subject or topic, they will provide materials for study, and they will give technical answers to technical questions. Uh, a teacher will evaluate a student on how to correct what they're doing according to a written doctrine uh, that is being taught or, or a documented uh, teaching method for the purpose of surviving a curriculum which has a pass and fail quotient to it. Sound familiar? My favorite quote, it is written. <laughs> it is written can be taken positively and negatively, depending on how you look at it. An instructor sounds like it does much the same thing, doesn't it? Except that an instructor will try to demonstrate the connection between the concept and the practice. He watches to see how the student interprets and develops this information, observation, and then makes suggestions and recommendations to guide the student towards an understanding. So you can see it's a difference. It's not so much about you must be right or you must be wrong. It's about how do we become right and wrong and according to you. The purpose of an instructor is to guide, to motivate, inspire uh, the students so that they can master themselves, their character, and ultimately uh, their lives using the principles that we teach. That's what instructors do. A teacher in an educational system from what I've seen, and I have many friends who are teachers, they mainly pass on information and correct mistakes. They follow a curriculum and they kind of shovel people along and try to keep the train moving. There are some teachers out there who are very good and they know how to inspire and motivate. These are not as common though. There are those who do correct and try to help people in a personal sense, yes. But there's also a great many others who are just there for the paycheck. And there's also the problem in the educational system. How old are your kids now, Patrick? Five, you're gonna find this out very soon. As they move up the chain, you're gonna find that there are teachers who are teaching subjects and they're not qualified to teach. You have the science teacher doing gym. You have the gym teacher teaching math. And these are not their subjects. And of course, the one that I'm always yelling about, any teacher teaching art, if they're not an artist. Because I'm an artist, I come from an art family. So when I see teachers trying to talk about art in school, I kind of cringe a little bit because I know that they don't know what they're talking about. You can't have a guy who's got a doctorate in math teaching how to do art, you know, <laughs> but unless they happen to be moonlighting as an artist in the background. There's exceptions to every rule. I did meet one math teacher who was an artist of math. He was brilliant. That's another story. <laughs> so when you look at the teacher instructors, we also have to kind of look at the idea of a coach. Because that's a different thing. When you're talking about sports, a coach is neither teacher or instructor. A coach is more kind of like a, a drill sergeant in a way. The function of a coach is to introduce basic skills, drill the players, observe their progress, and then push them to perform better for the purposes of winning or for some end goal that they perceive, that they're mandated for. So they're all about performance. That's the goal push, 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 and force and train, motivate and drill, and so on. Soccer teams, football teams, hockey teams, no different. You train your players, you find out who your marquee players are, you find out who your middle range players are, you find out who your bench setters are, and you try and manage your team towards a successful season. Theory is not their concern, and technical and motivational aspects as it relates to their performance is the only focus. So, being an instructor, however, and this is one of the things I think separates you know, the concept of instructor from anyone else, you know, an instructor, whether it be martial arts or anything else, is like a mentor. 
and being a mentor is a moral pursuit that emphasizes and is dependent upon forming relationships with the student and their understanding of what they're doing. But further emphasize that, the pursuit of skill is actually the goal in and of itself. We practice the eye, as Rona Sensei's quote said there, we're not practicing the eye to kill opponents, we're practicing the eye to face ourselves. And the practice in and of itself, that Zen of what we do, is in finding that moment in every action, right, where we achieve a degree of perfection for that instant where we can catch it. So it's there. It's there. That's our strive. That's our goal. And in doing that practice, we get better and better and better and better. And we're always working towards that end. So this is what instructors do, especially in martial arts. We guide people on that path. This is why we have the term sensei. Well, sensei is basically a more experienced person, a person of experience who's been there before. From his experience, he knows where you're at. He can help you get to where he's at. That's what we're about, helping people. That's an instructor. I think this is a good place to finish this conversation because mm. it pulls a full circle. We started okay. with a typical goal for a kid to join the martial arts is to prevent themselves from bullying or to be able to fight. And the path of the martial arts instructor is to help them realize their own character. I, I interject with a final thought. When I started Yai, I was about 21 going 22. And I had not yet achieved the black belt in the Kempo. Now I'm like ninth degree black belt 25 years later. And I can actually say that the number one source for how I arrived to these ideas has actually been through Yai. Yai, all the sense they come from Japan, over the years we pieced together. So these were major influences for me in coming up with this type of thing. I observed that Yai is very useful for teaching and it's helped me understand my other martial arts as well. Thank you so much. Um, we had some other things in on Slate, and I hope that we can have a future conversation to continue on with that stuff too. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to talk. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Cheers, man.